and they are blown away by the mask. They are blown away by the mask. There's so much love for the mask. There's so much love for the mask right now. Um, yes, so much excitement. So much excitement. <laughs> hey, everyone. Anthony Fantano here, Internet's busiest music nerd. Hope you're doing well. And we are here for a very special interview on our Twitch page. We have the one, the only singer, songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, producer, Matador Records recording artist, Mr. Will Toledo of Car Seat Headrest. How are you doing, man? Hi, Anthony. I am doing uh, pretty okay. How about you? I'm doing pretty okay in the midst of um, the quarantine, the police state, yeah. um, climate change, I mean, maybe yeah, I World War okay. Three. Yeah, pretty okay means World War Three. Yeah, World War Three might be starting between between uh, China and India. I didn't hear about that one. It's it. It could be a thing. Could be a thing. <laughs> but the, yeah, I'm I'm doing okay despite all of that. Um, I appreciate that you don't do a lot of these, uh, you know, sort of live video chat type of interviews very often. So uh, you know, we greatly appreciate you coming over here and and talking with us. Oh yeah, people don't ask ask me enough. Uh, I'm always down for a nice chat. Um, there are already people in the chat asking for you to date them, but uh, I, I don't think we're going to be fielding any sort of like you know romantic interest questions this evening. Though we will be taking questions from the chat later. So if you guys want to throw some good quality, not meme, not troll, genuine questions at will. Uh, our buddy Swar in chat will be looking for good questions periodically uh, to throw at will later in the interview. So if you guys have some genuine burning questions about Will, Carsey Headrest, uh, the new record, an old record, anything, you know, that might be a, a great conversation piece, make sure to throw it in the chat. Swar will be looking out for that. Um, so let's get started with a bit of a shout out. Uh, you've been doing some streaming on Twitch yourself lately if you want to quickly uh plug your channel and let us know what you've been doing over there uh, just just let us know fill us in on that oh yeah um my channel is called trait in common mm -hmm. um i have kind of opened it up just for whatever i want to do uh so far it's been acoustic live streams for the most part um to solo stuff um you know we were supposed to go on tour this summer and uh, it has been a bummer to say the least that we haven't been able to do that. So I kind of wanted to be doing something in the meantime. So I just, uh, have been setting up with acoustic guitar and, um, streaming when I get the chance, um, when I have the energy for it. Um, so I'm doing that. Um, my roommate Degnan also has, um, some musical talent. So sometimes me and him play together. Um, so it's just kind of a random thing, you know, whatever we can put together in our own home. Okay. Um, are you, you know, getting, getting some good subs through that? Is there an emote of the new mask? Is there like a twin <laughs> fantasy emote? Because pe people are going to go crazy for that. If there is that there. I don't know how to do that. Is Do I have the, the option to do that on Twitch? You you absolutely have the option to do that. I look. I I barely even knew what any of this stuff was three weeks ago. So like we can we can hook you up. We can tell you what's what after the whole thing and awesome. uh, get some good car seat headrest themed emotes going. So everybody can be in your chat spamming the car seat headrest emotes. You know we we over here we have flannel badges and we have Anthony heads and Cal heads. We have everything. So you know even even like the death grips masks. So you know we're oh, nice. we're, we're really like decked out in the emotes over here. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll just stop doing the performances and we'll just have emo emojis instead. Yeah, you can do emo emotes and emoji only chats where people are just spamming the emotes and everything. It's it's a, it's it's a special thing. It's a special thing. Cool. New end goal. All right. Well, let's let's move on to I guess um, the the elephant in the room and the biggest change to your aesthetic as of late, and and that's that's the mask, which personally just you know. Um, first impressions I find very endearing, um, despite also being a little apocalyptic as well. Uh, I, th I think the eyes do a lot to sell it. Uh, are, are the eyes sort of like on a bit of a loop or something? Or are they actually reacting to, you know, but like you're actually blinking in the mask? 
Yeah, they're just on a loop. So I've got a thing over here where I can change it up. Oh, wow. I'm just controlling it. Uh, ooh, that one doesn't read very well on uh, stream. So I, I usually just stick on a pretty neutral one. Um, but it is LED Bluetooth, and it can do pretty much whatever you can put on the grid, mm -hmm. uh, which is super neat. Um, and yeah, it is that that plus a real gas mask right now. Um, the plan was to make a different model of it that uh, I could sing through, basically. So right now, I've just got a, a mic stuck into it. Mm. Um, I think when we actually start playing live, there's going to be sort of a, a secret model where I can stick a, a better mic uh, underneath it and um, it'll be more transparent so sound can kind of pass through and I won't have this weird muffled quality to it. Mm. Um, but that is on hold for now and I've just got the real thing. That will, it, it'll be interesting to see if you can kind of land that perfect non-muffled sound with it with for the live setting into the future. In, in, in a sense, it does kind of remind me of what, um, uh, I don't know if he so much does it anymore, but uh, Brian Chippendale of Lightning Bolt, what he used to do. Have, are, you, are you familiar with um, with their live setup and what he does with the microphone? No. Yeah, I mean, Lightning Bolt, the drummer is typically the vocalist, and he uh, has almost like this very small contact type of microphone where the, the sound quality is almost like McDonald's drive through. Mm -hmm. And he fashioned a series of like raggedy cloths and stitched them together into like a, uh, a sheath that he pulls over his head and sort of, it holds the microphone right here. And as he is just like wildly drumming, just very aggressively, like Zach Hill, like kind of level drumming, although he would be insulted uh, for me to say that, um, because they have a bit of a beef going on, mm -hmm. but, uh, you know, that, that type of aggressive drumming. Um, it, the microphone stays in place and stays on his mouth okay. so he can do any kind of manner of screaming or shouting or whooping while they're kind of doing this frenzied psychedelic bass and drums noise rock. Yeah, that's a really smart thing to do if you're a drummer. I mean, I know, I remember seeing Whitney and they had the overhead mic just kind of dangling because that's another drummer singer. Um, but I like the idea of just taping it to your face. Um, but I think my sound guy would kill me if I did that for our show. So we had to work out a better way. <laughs> no, for sure. And, um, uh, I don't know. I'm just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm sort of just, again, amazed by the way it looks amazed by the aesthetic of it. Is this for you, um, a new, like an evolution, a transformation, or is this just Will Toledo with a different presentation? Would you say? Um, I think uh, kind of everything, um, you know, we put out a record called Making a Doorless Open. And to me, everything around it is just kind of the first step in what we're going to be doing for the next, you know, the next era of car seat headrest. Mm. Um, I don't know how long it's going to go or, or what exactly is going to be in it. But um, I kind of like to give myself a few things where it's, it's, you know, it's a starting point. Um, so I don't know what exactly this costume is going to turn into. Um, you know, when I started on it, I didn't really have a backstory or anything. I just knew that I was interested in this sort of, um, element of a performance where you could wear a mask or you could be different people on stage. And, um, so I kind of gave that to myself as a challenge and I've been kind of just making it up as I go along. Uh, actually, with the time off, um, one of the things I've been doing is trying to do more research and, and figure out the backstory. And I think I've got some leads on that. I think um, the next album that we do, I think will be hopefully some sort of rock opera explaining the origins. But uh, that is very new. That was just something I was thinking about last week. Mm -hmm. in, in, in a way, is this almost like an artistic type of escapism embodying this? Does this allow you to embrace other narratives or sing about other things? I mean, up until this point, your music tends to run pretty personal and just, uh, you know, dealing directly in, in your own sorts of, uh, uh, ups and downs and, you know, will this be a departure into something else that you're kind of making up whole cloth maybe? 
Maybe. Um, I think that, you know, every time you finish something or I finish something, um, you know, I don't want to do the exact same thing. Um, and I want to kind of look at other ways of doing it. Um, as far as music goes, you know, I always prefer writing personally. Um, I think if a song doesn't have a core that I relate to that, that, you know, I, I feel like came from me, then I can't really sing it as well. Um, but I think it's also just about being flexible about, um, about that, I guess. Um, you know, I, I mean, I think of artists like David Bowie, who had a lot of different uh, personas, a lot of different styles. But when I listen to his actual music, you know, I just hear him. Um, I hear his voice. And I think that he always wrote very personally in a way. But um, the, the theatrics of it was just kind of something that added to it and gave the live shows especially, um, you know, something special to it. No, I, I agree. I mean, for a long time, I've uh, kind of felt like there's a certain level of theatrics that came with a lot of the greatest artists in rock and popular music. And while it's it's certainly refreshing to be able to dive into some brands and artists in the punk scene and the indie scene where it's a lot more low key and people are kind of free to strip a lot of that back and uh, in a very personal way be as, as minimal as possible. But simultaneously, um, you know, it's it's nice every once in a while when somebody coming out of that scene is kind of putting in the effort to, I guess, lace in some kind of theatrics. You know, uh, I was just kind of revisiting uh, the other day, um, some of Montreal stuff and had been reminded like Kevin Barnes was like one of the most kind of extravagant kind of indie and indie pop artists of that era who I, you know, recall also being hugely influenced by Bowie, who was embodying different characters and narratives and so on and so forth. And, um, out of that scene prior and even since there, there hasn't been a whole, whole ton of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I really just, um, I want to stay true to, to what I am doing. And it's uh, sort of a weird paradox where, you know, like you said, in the, in indie scenes and punk scenes, um, it is nice to be able to kind of strip away the theatrics of it and, you know, have that, that small rock show vibe, you know, where it's you and a half dozen people in the audience and a band, you know, at the corner of some bar, just sweating it out together. Um, but it is a weird challenge to kind of translate that um, once you're not playing those places anymore. You know, we, we're playing venues that just have nothing to do to me with sort of where that spirit of rock and roll comes from, that particular sort of, you know, face-to-face -face confrontational performance. Um, and, you know, I've done those shows and I still do those shows. Actually, we, me and Andrew went and did a tour as One Trait Danger, um, you know, our side project together. And we were back in those sorts of bars and we were back doing those sorts of shows. Um, and that's a, just a really special sort of energy. But once you get to a different stage, a larger stage, you have to change what you're doing to really fit and and do something that makes sense in the larger space and you know what makes sense is just to to lean into those theatrics i think because you're you know after a certain point you literally are playing in a theater you have the lights you have what looks like you know the seats of a movie theater that are in front of you um you know you have a balcony etc cetera, etc cetera. and um you know i'm just i'm not really into pretending like it's, you know, like we're a, a scrappy little punk band at that point. Um, you know, regardless of how, how I might feel, I might not feel like I own that stage. But um, I would rather try to work my way up to that than just um, it, totally ignore where we actually are. You know, environment is just a huge part of music. Mm -hmm. So 
I mean, obviously, the, the, the theatrics that you're embracing here are, are as you're saying, a reaction to the larger numbers and the larger spaces and wanting to play to that. But is, is this and also some of the, the narratives that you're exploring on your new LP, especially with the final track, a, a reaction to what I guess you see as your fame at this point as an artist or just a persona, uh, whether you, uh, you know, feel on an individual level, like a famous person, or if you feel like what's famous is just what people see as the, the image of you. Yeah. I don't really feel, I don't really feel famous. And the people that I spend most of the t- most of my time around don't think that I'm famous. Hmm. Um, to me, that kind of element on it, on the record that came less from my personal experience and more looking at really musical trends, um, you know, looking at pop music and looking at different sorts of new music. Um, you know, th- there's a huge correlation between lyrics and pop music and discussions of fame, discussions of success and material success, especially. And one thing that I wanted Madlow to be was, um, some sort of take almost some sort of homage to, pop music in 2018, 2019, you know, when I was really listening to it and trying to track on it, um, I wanted to take those subjects that everyone was talking about, you know, Post Malone singing about being a rock star, uh, whatever the hell that means. Um, (laughs) You know, I, I was interested in doing something that was my own take on that, which is a lot more uh, removed from the central scene, you know, so to me, a song like famous, you know, that, that title has a lot of irony to it. I don't think that the content of it really has anything to do with being famous at all. I think it is a much more personal thing. But, uh, I don't know in your current artistic form, I guess, and then where you see yourself moving with car seat headrest, do you feel like you're personally trending in that direction? Um, I, I personally find it really interesting that, uh, and, and I know that, uh, you, you've been in the music scene for a long time and have been around long enough to sort of see the way the internet has revolutionized things. It feels like to me more and more every year that there is like way less of, just a barrier between what is effectively the underground and what's effectively the mainstream. I mean, I remember back in the day, just again, to think of, of Montreal and the time in which their music was very popular and relevant and the hottest thing. While sure, you did have some artists coming out of that scene that occasionally they'd chart in a very minor fashion or a song would pop up in a commercial, like, you know, in a big ad deal or something. But, uh, for the most part, like if you wanted anybody to hear these bands, like you were fighting tooth and nail for that to be the case. And, uh, these days, especially with streaming services, if you're getting, you know, good recommendations and plays, like it can be very easy to get very sudden exposure that you weren't expecting to, uh, suddenly. I mean, even in the TikTok game, I mean, have, you know, I, I think maybe with the next record, we need a TikTok dance craze just to really kind of push it, push it over. That's not up to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's one reason why I was checking out pop music a lot more. Um, you know, growing up to me, you, you know, pop music was what I heard on the radio, what I heard people and random people in high school listening to. And indie music was something that just seemed like it was from a different world. Um, you know, it, it just wasn't operating on that level. I didn't hear it in the same places. And, you know, they just seemed like totally different things. You know, they weren't even part of the same medium, really. Um, But now I don't know if it's my perspective, you know, just being more connected in the industry or if there's a real change in what's going on. Um, But it does feel like there's a lot more just kind of across the spectrum stuff. And people who are just recording in their bedrooms are, you know, going to number one on Billboard, uh, all of that shit. Um, sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to cuss on here. It's Twitch, oh, you can so you can swear. That's totally I, fine. Uh, there's no censors, but um, I'll try to censor myself. No censors, no censors. You're totally good. Any Christians in the the room? <laughs> yeah, this, um, this this is a Christian Twitch page. Good, um, but um, yeah, it, it's um, it's really heartening to see 
people making music on their computer solo and have it take off because, you know, that's what I did starting off. And that's kind of how we made Madlow um, was just fucking around on a computer until we had stuff that we really liked. And, um, you know, th that's kind of why I wanted to lean into these pop stylings with this is, you know, I've always made music on a computer and for, Oh, you know, a couple of records with Matador, we were really more in the studio, you know, doing it as a band. And, um, you know, those were albums where it worked to do that, but I wanted to make something that really represented more, um, you know, the sounds that you could get on a computer that you can't get in a studio. Hmm. I'll do a takeoff question from that in a sec, but before I do, I wanted to also ask you, um, that process of sort of doing it on the computer and being in that space as opposed to the studio, uh, even if there are, I don't know, maybe difficulties or learning curves or whatever, do you find that process or did you find that process with this record more freeing? Um, or I guess less limitations? Every time I start a record, I think that the way I'm going to be doing it is more freeing. And then I get into the process of it and I see the difficulties and I walk through the, the patches of thorns and then I get to the other side and I have a finished record and I think I'm going to do it completely different next time. Mm. Um, but, you know, it's always something different. It's always a learning process. Um, you know, Teens of Denial it was pretty much totally in the studio and we mixed it at Steve Fisk's house. Um, I wasn't really at the board for most of it. Um, recording twin fantasy, we recorded it 90% in studio. I did some overdubs at home and I would kind of bounce back and forth mixing it, um, at decade studios in Chicago and mixing it at home. Um, and so going into Madlow, it was kind of like, let's, kind of flip the ratio and spend most of the time at home and do just what we really need to do in the studio, which is really just drums and anything that we wanted to do together as a band. Um, but just kind of take that studio time as an opportunity to mess around with these songs as a band and then take it home and chop it up and pull it apart and see what we can make out of those jam sessions. Hmm. And, um, to reflect back on the pop music thing, because it just kind of popped back in my head, uh, I find it really funny and interesting that that was such a huge point of, I guess, inspiration or creative drive, because personally, I think uh, a lot of the tracks on this project are some of your most experimental since coming through on Matador. You know, I mean, I mean especially the closer or the hymn remix track. Um, I mean, at least in my opinion, kind of far removed from what most people would just kind of generally perceive as pop music and just and just generally from what people expect from your music. Typically, I think most fans probably didn't expect a song like Hollywood to come through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, um, when I say I was listening to pop music, I definitely was not only listening to pop music mm. um, and I was trying to grab from just as large a spectrum as possible. Um, but, you know, something like him remix. Um, it's not necessarily top 40 pop, but there's definitely a huge, you know, e EDM instrumental um, scene. You know, that's kind of the forefront of where music production is at right now. Mm -hmm. And um, that music is just, a lot of it is really exciting and really adventurous. And um, when I just go on SoundCloud and kind of deep dive into those labels and those artists that are doing that kind of stuff, um, you know, it always just blows me away and I want to do something like that. So the hymn remix really came out of just wanting to do something that was straight up in that vein. Um, Hollywood, you know, uh, again, kind of not, um, not a typical top 40 pop song, uh, but maybe in a way, you know, maybe in, a, in another way, it, it kind of fits the bill. Um, you know, I, I, I like novelty songs, I guess. I like songs that kind of um, ride that line of weird emotion where you laugh and then suddenly you're into it. Um, you know, it's difficult for a song to pull that off, I think, 
to be the right energy. And um, that was what I was going for for Hollywood, I think. Um, but actually, I remember there was a little Wayne, a little Wayne song, um, a little Wayne song that uh, the hook was just, um, what the fuck though? Where the love go? Five, four, three, two, I let one go. <laughs> and he just kind of used, you know, that was sort of the chorus. Um, but he just kind of used it as a diving board. You know, he would go back to it and then the whole song would kind of develop off of that. And you just have this one note loop uh, going on underneath it. And that was just so cool to me to have a song like that, that sort of used this refrain in a, in a completely different way. You know, so it's, it's not the culmination of the song. It's really the starting point. Um, so I think with Hollywood, I was trying to do something like that, where Hollywood want, makes you want to puke. You know, that's sort of the diving board for where the rest of the song goes. You know, that, that really lit up the chat. I have to ask, are, are you very deep into the, into the Wheezy uh, mixtape catalog? No ceilings or, or anything like that? Yeah, I, I mm -hmm. fell in love with that song. I think it was, um, I think it showed up on top of Spotify charts at one point. And, mm -hmm. um, but uh, I'm I'm still a newbie. Uh, yeah, give me some wrecks. That's that's fine. You know, we can we can talk about that later for for sure. No problem. Um, I I find it interesting what you were saying before about trying to embrace certain aesthetics and sounds and styles, but you know, using the computer as the conduit for that. Um, it sort of reminds me of other bands out there like Code Orange. I don't know how familiar you are with their work, but uh, with their latest LP that they just dropped, um, they, they worked so hard on trying to create the vibe and the heaviness of a metal and a metalcore record, but simultaneously have it be so synthetic and have it be kind of created in that kind of just computer oriented process where it hits hard, you want to mosh to it, it goes crazy, it goes off, but it just feels like you're listening to an electronic composition. You know, what you're listening to is completely computer generated. Um, you know, do you feel yourself moving more in a direction where you are sort of embracing more electronic aesthetics in the future or try to make, I guess, a more familiar car seat headrest sound translate into a more visceral but synthetic kind of, a, a, I guess, a plane or state of existence uh, i could see either direction for sure um you know what i've always liked about car seat headrest and what i've tried to keep it as is something where you know it's always open and if something comes along um i can sort of run into it head first um so i mean you know what's been going on right now you know we've been in lockdown and quarantine and i've just been writing a lot to, to try and fill the time and um, that sort of puts me in the vein more, you know, more in what people might think of this old school car seat headrest, you know, guitar based stuff, um, stuff that is, um, you know, more developed, I guess, lyrically, um, or has that, that sort of bent to it. Um, you know, one thing I think Madlow is not is sort of a, you know, dim the lights, um, watch it like it's a it's a movie kind of deal i think it's a, a record that i wanted to sort of have a social atmosphere to it you know even just driving around with friends you could put it on and um unfortunately we re released it at uh, the worst possible time in history for that sort of a record um i think what people want right now is that sort of you know turn the lights off and play it like it's a movie kind of deal so that's that's the sort of thing that i'm writing right now um, for all I know, by the time I finish it and put it out, uh, no one's going to want that kind of thing anymore. But you know, you just got to do the thing and do it do it well. I, I, well, I mean, looking at the way that our government is handling the pandemic currently, I think we're going to be in this situation for a while. So um, I, I think uh, there will be people in that that mood for a little bit. So I guess you know, it's, great news for me. Yes, great, great news for you and your creative process. You have quite a bit of time to to do that. Um, speaking of the pandemic, I, I know that you're out on the, uh, out on the West coast, right? Is, is that, is that true? Yeah. Yeah. When, when things let up, uh, do you have any desire or do you have any plans to do a performance at the Chaz, the uh, Capitol Hill autonomous zone? Will, will you be uh, doing a live set over there? If they invite us, you know, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I We'll see, I guess. It's, I don't know if it's, there's a music thing involved in it right now. I know Ethan's been there. Um, I'm kind of stuck 
outside of the city. I'm not able to participate in city events, but yeah, Ethan's visited the spot. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I've, I've heard that there's music and stages there all the time though. Again, oh. uh, pandemic times, um, I don't know how safe any of that is. Um, and, uh, uh, but still, uh, speaking of that and speaking of kind of the, uh, times that we're in the middle of, I see also, um, recently you had a uh, uh, talked some of that talk on social media about uh, police brutality and and BLM and and all that uh, which I mean I I and uh, some other close friends of mine have been outspoken about as well uh, there's been a lot of uh, controversy and back and forth as of late in terms of like what artists are saying something and what artists aren't saying something and like what obligations artists have to speak out against such things. Um, you know, you don't necessarily need to speak to that, but personally, uh, what, what pushed you over the line to where you felt like you needed to, um, say something more, maybe continually say something outside of just like, you know, posting a black square or whatever. Mm -hmm. I think it is just, um, it, it comes down to personal responsibility of the artist. And, and, you know, I've always kind of felt um, to an extent, uh, an artist is a public speaker, you know, if they're putting something out there to the public um, that's communication. And a part of that is, you know, spreading stuff that you think is important. And um, I, I try to not tweet too much these days because I, I think I'm pretty bad at it. I think uh, people who are really good at Twitter are probably psychopaths, but um, I'm pretty bad at it. I get my foot in my mouth a lot, but um, you know, uh, in terms of this, I just said what, uh, you know, what I observed, which was that, um, you know, these videos of cops, uh, assaulting protesters, you know, it, it completely proves this whole thing right, that um, they don't deserve the power that they've got. You know, if they've got any sort of authority, it has got to be that they are the guardians of the people and they are just 100% proving that that's not what the case is. That's not what they're here to do. And um, I think that they don't really care that, that it's clear that this is the point. I think that is just complete power move, you know, who's stronger. And that is completely justifying all the protesting that is going on. And it's got to keep happening. Yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I find uh, the situation that we're in currently post all this kind of interesting is the uh, saying interesting so many times, but still, um, what I find intriguing about it is it seems like we've moved through this handful of weeks where you have heavy protesting and heavy reaction, violent reaction to that protesting from police. And while that is still going on to some degree, it seems like simultaneously uh, those who would wish for things to say the same um, are coming to the realization that just putting out hours of footage of beating protesters is making Black Lives Matter and just the fight against all of this very sympathetic. I mean, the polls on this stuff are like through the roof. And um, now it seems like there's a bit more focus on like, hey, let's actually maybe have some repercussions for this stuff and put forward a few very no teeth type of reforms and see if people will just kind of accept that and start going home and just like think everything is cool now. And um, I, I hope that people don't take the bait on that. Um, I hope right. that people sort of see through just how transparent, especially that executive order that Trump just passed is where federally you're essentially banning things that in many states are already illegal and mm -hmm. aren't, aren't supposed to be done anyway, but still there are officers getting away with them because there's always this excuse of like, oh, well, I was fearing for my life. So because of that, et cetera, it's fine. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the things I retweeted was um, this thing I didn't know about in Eugene, which is actually where Andrew grew up, um, uh, called Cahoots, which is um, a portion of the police budget goes to it. And, um, you know, if something, something is going on, you know, there's a mental crisis or there's some strange situation and you don't know what to do, you call Cahoots and they come and they're not armed. And, you know, they're trained to deal with mental crises. They're trained with trauma. And, you know, a lot of them come from backgrounds where they don't like authority. You know, they don't like the police. Um, the people, one of the people who was being interviewed, um, their dad had been killed in a police confrontation. Um, 
but you know they come and they deal with the situation nonviolently and um it, and they were talking about you know how successful they were and how few things they had to actually pass on to the police you know i think that um it would be really really great if we actually got these sorts of reforms where we really shrank shrank down to a, a little tiny nub you know the portion of police budget that actually went to law enforcement of the kind we're used to and instead it went towards this sort of um you know people who were actually out to protect the public that would be great um we'll pick things up with uh, some audience questions so if you guys want to throw some good ones into the chat luis will be looking out for those we have a few already lined up but one more question that i have for you before we get into that is uh um now that uh uh, you know, Smash Mouth has covered a car seat headrest song uh, with with something soon. If you died tomorrow, would you say that you could die happy with with having that under your belt now? That happened a while ago. That was I mean, like a year still, ago. still, it's quite the um, success. Um, if I was dying tomorrow, I probably wouldn't be happy. Um, <laughs> it, it's nice that that happened, and definitely, it is that just sort of you know totally random never would have expected it thing that, you know, that reminds you why you do it and where you are in life. That's super cool. Um, but it's, it's just, you know, it is always totally unexpected and you can never bank on it, but it's, it's really rewarding when it does. I mean, you, you were pretty young in the late nineties. Do you have vague memories around that time of, of all star being a, a popular song or a semi-popular song? I mean, I remember it just kind of being a tie in with a, a very bad superhero movie that people forgot about, but uh, then it sort of gained new traction as kind of a Shrek type song. And now it has this incredible meme to it that seems like totally unstoppable. Yeah, definitely. But I think I was into most of Astro Lounge. Oh, um, dude. You know, just a, a good, um, good pop album. And I think, um, I think there's a lot of influence there from the Monkees, which is another group that I was totally into. Um, didn't have the biggest sort of rock legacy um, to them, but but still a really good pop band and um you know i talked to greg who is the songwriter for smash mouth and he's just a really cool dude and kind of into it for the same reasons i'm into it and it's really gratifying to make that connection all right um let's go through some of these audience questions and takes they seem to have some good ones especially diving into some of the older stuff uh kairos kid says hey will i'm a huge fan of your album how to leave town uh, would i be th or would you be thinking about doing a similar thing with uh, that album that you did with twin fantasy like doing a redo or anything like that since it seems to be kind of a fan favorite for him um i wouldn't do a redo because i think that i i got it right the first time on that one hmm. um I, I was happy with how it turned out at the time I can definitely see revisiting it for some sort of anniversary. Um, you know, I've st and, I, and I've still got the mixes for that. For the original Twin Fantasy, I actually lost everything. Um, I don't have files for anything earlier than 2013. Mm. Uh, but I do have How to Leave Town, so I could remix it if I wanted to um, and do, you know, some sort of thing. But... Um, Eventually, you know, everything in time, it's, it's on the list, but it's not at the top of the list. I had a comment about that on, I think a let's argue video or something about how it was like a, a terrible idea for you to have redone it. And, and I think I had just kind of guessed saying that I, I don't think he would have, if he didn't feel like either there was something wrong or there was something that he could improve. I mean, you, you feel like uh, I mean, at, at least like originally you had, you had missed the mark enough to want to go back and redo it. Was it because of something itching, something unfinished, or you just felt like you could have done what you did better and you just still had such a soft spot for those songs? Or was it also just kind of the, the general fan and audience love of those tracks? I mean, that's kind of a very well-regarded album amongst your fans. Um, I don't think that it missed the mark, but I know that at the time, um, you know, I was limited by what I could do at the time, which was mm. just recording in my bedroom. And um, I really liked the tracks a lot. And I got them to a point where, you know, they sounded good for being made in that environment. But 
um, you know, I, I always just saw it as such a big picture record. And when I put it out, um, you know, all that happened was I put it out, a few people downloaded it and I tried to spread it around where I could. And, um, you know, it took a long time before people started listening to it. It was a couple of years before it really started gaining that legacy that it has now, you know, where it's something that has stuck around. Um, but, you know, in my mind, in the meantime, it, it was kind of like, you know, that part of it felt unresolved to me. You know, it, it felt like I, I always want some sort of big release where, you know, confetti comes out of the sky and I think, oh, I'm finally done with this record. Um, and instead, there's just all these loose ends and these instrumentals that you have to bounce. And uh, sometimes you have to re-deliver the record or and uh, and um, it, it's it's always a letdown to finish a record. And um, when I was doing it independently, I just thought, well, if I ever get on a label, it won't be a letdown anymore. Uh, but so far, it's always been a letdown. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, maybe next time it won't. Um, Isid, this this information is probably out there to some degree, but Isidore is asking, where did the art and the concept for Twin Fantasy come from? Because it's such a simple yet iconic image. Um, I was interested. I, well, that's kind of what I was interested in is, you know, something that was simple. Um, yeah, I like uh, illusions, you know, visual tricks, trompe de l'île, or however you pronounce that. Um, I like simple things that, that the more that you look at it, uh, the more complicated it gets. And I know that I just kind of sketched out different ways of doing that with those characters until I, I landed on something that had the right degree where it looked simple. It looked like it came through, um, but it had some, some weird details to it the longer that you looked. And, um, Originally, I, I was making that as sort of just a, a rough design. Um, Kate Wirtz, who I've collaborated with on many records since, um, I was going to pass it off to her and have her sort of do some sort of take on it, uh, color it and, and chop it up and, and make it weirder. Um, but she liked it as it was. She said, just just go with the, the white, the simple design. And that's what ended up happening. The the more I think about it right now in this moment, it kind of reminds me of some of the uh, very rough and early drawings that you would see on like Daniel Johnson's stuff. Yeah, yeah. In retrospect, it, it's definitely paying tribute to to something like "Hi, how are you?" I think at the time, I was probably overlooking that in favor of uh, thinking I was doing something totally original. <laughs> that's that's all of us. That's all of us every day. <laughs> Um, Hazy Cloak is asking, um, or no, rather a real boy is asking, uh, and, and we'll get to the Hazy Cloak right after. Uh, do you have a happy place? This person says their happy place is a river when they're alone. So I guess just chilling next to a river. Do you have a happy place, a happy physical, physical place? There is a little stream right outside my apartment. Um, just if you walk off the parking lot, uh, right next to it, there's just a little tiny stream, um, there's a couple of beavers, which I've never actually seen, but my friend has, and they've actually, uh, put up wire fences around a lot of the trees to prevent the beavers from, uh, chipping away at them. But, um, I like to, right now I like to go out there, um, just because, uh, with quarantine, it is hard even to go outside and stroll around and feel like you're getting relaxed. Mm. But, uh, that little patch right there. Um, you know, no one's really occupying it because it's just a tiny space between a parking lot and a road. But um, there's just enough nature there that I feel like uh, I'm somewhere different, which is what I need when I'm spending most of my time in my apartment. Mm. Um, Hazy Cloak, to go back to that, they ask, and this is something I was kind of curious about as well. Uh, how long have you been using Bandcamp, and would you ever bring back some of the old Nervous Young Men Bandcamp pages? I know there are a lot of other Bandcamp releases that are just like way like back in the dark ages for you that um, are no longer like kind of live anymore. Like, would you ever consider bringing any of those releases back? Anything like that, or you know what Hazy Cloak is asking for here? Yeah, I don't see a, a huge reason to do that because. 
they're all on YouTube and et cetera. Just fans mm-hmm. have uploaded it. And, you know, I'm not going to copyright strike that. I, I don't care. Um, I think that's a good way for people to listen to it. Um, if I, uh, if I put that on Bandcamp, it would kind of be promoting it in a weird way for me. You know, I can see, you know, somewhere way down the line, maybe if, if there's a time to look back on that whole era, I might put something up like that. But, um, for the main part, I'm, I'm content with it just being, you know, where it is just in corners of the internet where you can find it if you want to. Okay. Um, hentai Jesus wants to know <laughs> what is your favorite anime? Good, a Christian. Um, yes, yes, yes. A, a good Christian from the chat. Yeah. Um, boy, uh, you know, I might have to be just an anime noob and say Miyazaki. Um, I haven't watched, I haven't watched any that I've liked recently. Um, but, um, you know, when it works, it works. And Miyazaki has, one of the highest hit records of, well, any director, you know, West or East, but, um, I can pretty reliably put a film by him on and be impressed with it. Mm. No, I mean, I'm, I'm a bit of a, an anime noob myself. Um, so, you know, no, no pressure there or anything like that. We're not an anime elitist club, although there are some people who are probably like that in chat. We'll ban them instantly. We'll ban them instantly if they, uh, if they start, you know, any shit. Um, underscore penguins wants to know if during quarantine, have you been working on any one trait danger stuff, you know, or if, if that's like a project that you're still kind of continuing. Well, uh, Andrew has, um, <laughs> it's, he's, the process is that he's making, well, he's, he's finally put it on hold, but he was making it. And then he was trying to get me to contribute. And then I would say, just, no, like, um, it, it requires a certain sort of, uh, energy to make those sorts of tracks. Uh, you need to be in a certain sort of mood to do it. And I really have not been in quite that sort of mood recently. Um, but Andrew, who, who is always making something and always active, uh, was making those tracks and it was a bit of a point of, uh, tenseness for a little bit. Uh, but he's put it on hold and actually he's his main thing right now is uh, a video game uh, because he made a game for the last one trade album and we stuck it on a hard drive or the thumb drive that we were selling it on and he said he would never make another game because it was way too hard Um, but fortunately he changed his mind and he's been working with a few game developers and this new one is way cooler um i've seen a lot of it and there's just a lot going on there's puzzles there's fighting um i've helped design it um i'm actually supposed to be finding some renaissance paintings to stick in it which i am behind on doing um but uh he's putting his all into it and we're all throwing ideas to to make it even better and i'm i think he's hoping that by the end of the year, uh, we're going to be able to put that out and it's going to be like an online sort of thing. And will that be sort of living on a page or will that be up for purchase on like a platform like steam or something? Like how exactly do you, uh, you know, think that's going to end up working? Yeah, I think it's going to be on steam, but it's, it's going to be like online play based. So okay. you go on and then sort of every day there's, there's some sort of boss battle that's going on. Uh, I don't want to give any spoilers, but, uh, yeah, I think, uh, I think some people are going to have a lot of fun with it and some people are going to have absolutely no fun at all with it. <laughs> well, either way, it sounds ambitious as fuck. I'll, I'll just, I'll leave it at that. It certainly is that. Um, Joe Lewis wants to know specifically that they, they said, uh, uh, first, thank you for visiting, uh, uh, or having visited your alma mater. This person, I guess had visited your school or something and they're asking you, uh, how your experiences at college shaped, y- you know, your music in general. They're asking pre Matador signing and post, but I, I think you can kind of just speak to that generally. Your experiences in college, how how have they kind of informed kind of your writing process, your storytelling, just anything to do with kind of your your output, really? Um, well, I kind of lucked out where, um, you know, I was a humanities major, and um, 
ended up having one of the few jobs where that might actually matter mm. uh, to get that that sort of education. Um, you know, but I really did luck out that um, I had um, the opportunity to go to college, you know, that my parents could afford it. And um, they didn't push me too hard in any one direction. So I ended up doing English and I minored in religious studies. Um, and both of those things just ended up being in my music a lot, you know, kind of permanently. Um, I just got a lot of grounding that uh, interested me, you know, as far as um, reading poetry and and wanting to write like that, wanting to write big stuff like that, just kind of learning how, how words could work basically. And then just, um, you know, you can definitely hear it in the records that I made while I was in college. I was really just throwing, um, throwing what I was learning right onto the record. You know, a song like um, Overexposed off of Monomania. Um, I revisited that recently for a stream. And I remember like 50% of it, I feel like came from this art study class I was doing. Um, you know, uh, all the metaphors in it are about photography and painting and et cetera. And, um, you know, it, it's just a good window um, if you want to get artsy about stuff, you know, you have to have different things that you're learning about or experiencing and, and college is a good place to do that. But, you know, you can also just do that on your own time. You can read and, and watch YouTubes and learn about different things that then you can write poetically about. I have three more fantastic fan questions over here. If you don't mind taking them, is that fine? Yeah. Cool. And, uh, you know, then we'll get you out of here. And again, thank you very much for uh, coming by and talking to me and being so uh, generous with your time. Um, do Ritos 33, presumably another Christian in the, in the chat, uh, asks, do you regret being very personal in your earlier work? And would you, uh, advise other bands to stay away from that sort of, uh, writing in their own stuff? Um, I wouldn't, well, I would advise, um, people not to put naked pictures of themselves on records, um, <laughs> unless you really want to commit to that for life uh, sure. in terms of material on records um you know I, I moved away from stuff that didn't work for me personally um you know there are a few you know, a few songs starting out um i don't feel like it's a majority of them but a few that are just very sort of you know primal scream or, or, or that sort of thing you know no no art no artifice kind of idea um but that just never really felt true to me you know it felt like no matter how sort of stripped down or improvised i got you know i, I didn't feel like it made it more genuine i felt like it, it was still a load of crap somehow so the answer for me was just move in the opposite direction and move towards more poetry more more crafting stuff and thinking about it beforehand um so i, I ended up with a lot of material that you know it, it has a certainly a personal edge to it but um, most of it is crafted to a degree and, and has the thought put into it, the editing put into it um, before I release it to a public. And it's really just a matter you know, of finding out what works for your voice and what makes you feel uh, like you're getting across what you want to get across. And um, Will Torpedo asks, obviously a, a mega fan there, Will Torpedo, um, <laughs> would you still recommend... Uh, Bandcamp as a platform for new artists to put their music out there, get their music up there. I mean, I can say personally, I just read a piece the other day just about how, um, at least small time bands anyway, uh, how much more money they're making over there as opposed to streaming or anywhere else. But, uh, uh, you know, according to you, as somebody who's kind of started on the platform and kind of blew up on the platform, would you still recommend for other artists to uh, be doing their stuff over there, operating their kind of band business there? Absolutely. Um, I'm, I'm so glad that Bandcamp is one of the few things where in 2020, um, it looks like the same website that it looked like in 2008 or whenever I joined it. Mm. Um, they don't have that many more services than they did then. They don't, they, you know, they haven't changed their UI that much. They haven't, uh, they, you know, they haven't lost what made them essential at the time, which was 
just a platform for people who are making music on a completely different or a completely independent level um, to be able to put it out. And it, it looks like a record and you can play through it like a record and you can buy it like it's a record. Um, you know, there was no other real way of doing that in 20, in 2008. And um, I think it's, it's still the best way now if you're um, coming into it in 2020. Um, I, I do think that um, it's, it can be part of, of a larger thing now where you can get it on streaming as well. Um, you know, all my older records I still have on streaming through DistroKid, just like uh, 10 to $20 a year um, for putting your records on there and getting them on Spotify, Apple Music, et cetera. Excuse you. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that is good. You know, for people who use those platforms, you can have it on there. That's nice. In When I was in high school, you didn't have that. You had iTunes and a very uh, esoteric way of getting albums onto iTunes that never worked. Um, now you have more reliable ways of doing that. Um, but I think it's it's all it's possible to put that all together where you're using all these platforms um, at not a lot of cost and, you know, being able to have your record on there and get it out. I'll say one of the best developments over there since, you know, the time that you were talking about is that they've done an excellent job of editorializing the platform where it's like, you know, you don't even need to be pitching your record around to whatever music publication. I know people who, you know, have very small or no followings and have kind of just pitched their stuff to the Bandcamp platform and they do a write up on it and they post it on the front page or they put it in an overall list. And, you know, it's, it's kind of the perfect place to have your album placed because you don't need to from there make the pitch to whatever audience reading it or seeing it that, Hey, if you like this, you should buy it because that's literally what people People are there for you know they're not there yeah. to do anything else so um you know good on them for being able to just kind of be a a, a one-stop shop in that in that sense you know that they're just kind of promoting what they feel like is is good on the platform on top of that um, yeah no that's that's good i really hope the one thing that they don't get rid of on the main page is just um if you want to you can go to go down to the bottom and you can just select new releases from any genre and that will get you just completely random. You know, whoever, whoever uploaded recently, um, just a total spread of what's going on on that website, um, no curation or anything. And that's what I like to do when I go on Bandcamp. Um, you know, I just like to see what people are putting out, um, you know, even if they don't have the followers, if no one is listening to their music. Um, you know, it, it's it's always I, I pretty much always find something interesting if i look through a dozen records i find something worth purchasing and um it, it is just really nice to get that feeling of, of browsing through basically an endless music store and i hope that uh, they continue to have that feature it feels like a bit of you know a, a web 1.0 feature where where there's no sense of curation to it uh, but that's just what i like about it and so i hope they keep it yeah, it's, it's nice to sort of be, um, it's, it's nice to be on a music site that you feel like is kind of pitching some algorithm to you or something, at, at least like in, in some portions or in some pockets. Um, you know, one feature I like on the front page, which I, I think they're still maintaining, or at least on some part of the website is, you know, what pops up is what people have just bought. So it's mm -hmm. like what other people are just kind of like, you know, willing to throw their money at, you know, you think of somebody's willing to throw their money at it. There's a certain level of like fandom or commitment to it <laughs> that, uh, you know, th that, that there would be to any other thing. So, I mean, that's, that's typically what, you know, I'll, I'll pop into every once in a while. Um, but, uh, last question, uh, and, and this, this one's a pretty basic one, but, uh, uh, etches asks, uh, artistically, would you consider yourself a perfectionist? Oh, that's interesting. I was just reading a, a Kubrick interview um, where the interviewer accused him of being a neurotic perfectionist, and uh, he denied it. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't uh, accuse you of that in this, in this yeah, interview. No. Um, no, this has been great. Um, but I th perfectionist is, a, is kind of a weird word um, 
because I don't, I don't know if there's any creator who's really a perfectionist so much as just, um, there's, there's people who want to write it out to the finish and there's people, you know, there's sort of varying degrees of how willing you are to ride something out to the finish line. Um, and so, you know, for something like Madlow, um, I definitely was not striving for perfection on that record. Um, what I wanted to do and what I sort of refused to let the album be done until I felt like it was the case was to just sort of fill out the cracks of each song until I felt like there were not dry patches. You know, there were not elements of the music that, that felt second rate, you know, that, that felt like they were just bridging from one part of it to another. You know, if you, if you write a song, you kind of have a few ideas, um, you, you know, you have some good stuff, you have a few good lines. And um, if you bash it out and, and you don't really care about finishing it, then that's kind of what you end up with is a song with a few good lines or with a few good ideas in it. And um, it always just frustrates me to listen to that. You know, I'd almost rather listen to music with no good ideas uh, because, you know, at least then there's some honesty. But um, if you have some good ideas, I think it's, it's worth it to push the song and not let it be done until it is really just start to finish, you know, so, something that, uh, ma- you know, the level matches throughout. Hmm. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming through here. And, uh, one more time. Uh, I mean, obviously everybody knows that, uh, this is Will Toledo of Carsey headrest. I mean, it's been underneath your head the entire time, but because we have like three, four or five times more viewers than we did when we originally started this out, do you want to shout out your Twitch page one more time? Sure. Uh, Twitch TV slash trait in common. And, um, I will be streaming on there at a completely random interval. So stay tuned. Stay tuned and sub over there and make sure that you're following and get notifications. And uh, uh, yeah, that's all. Thanks very much for coming on, man, and being so open and uh, just talking about everything and being a great interviewer. Oh, I'm, you know, I'm the interviewer, being a great interviewee. <laughs> I'll be the interviewer next time. Oh, shit. Yeah, I'll, I'll pop onto your channel. Yeah, yeah. All right, that sounds good. No, thanks so much for having me, Anthony. All right, well, have a good one, man.